everybody. Welcome to Steve with Tan Books. Coming at you with Father Jam Bone on... We're going to cover Ignatius Spiritual Retreats. But Father, first, welcome. Thank you for coming on. And uh, can Thank you lead us off in a prayer? Oh, yes. In nome Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Deus, qui coro filum Sancti, Spiritus Illustratum Locuisti, dano be Signor Spiritus Recta Sapere, et de eu semper consolatione gaudiri per Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. Ave Maria, grazie plena, nomine stecum. Benedicta tu, Maria di Puse, benedictus fruto ventris tu, Iesus. Santa Maria, Maria Madre Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc in ora mortis nostri, amen. In nome Patris et Fili, Spiritus Sancti, amen. Amen. Thank you, Padre. Didn't You're know welcome. if you knew, knew I knew some Latin, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ignatius, the spiritual retreats, given from heaven, he was given from heaven, right? Yes. All right. I've I've seen. I remember reading one thing about. You remember, like uh, Dominicans. Some of them don't uh, think that our, uh, Dominic got the rosary from heaven now, and some Carmelites don't think that the scapular came from heaven. And I've actually seen Ignatius. I think that was part of the the movie that I didn't like that came out. And I was going, where was the heavenly inspiration of the exercise? They just came up with it. Uh, I was really disappointed in that part. So. Yes, the exercises were given from heaven. What power, why is these even important? Yes, well, it's very important. Um, I think it is perhaps one, one of the most important aspects that keeps us out of the polemics between liberal and traditional. Um, you know, Latin Mass, Novus Ordo Mass. It is the thing that keeps us Catholic, like keeps us out of the polemics because it brings us so deeply into our roots it convinces a soul so thoroughly of the things of heaven mm -hmm. that it just it sweeps us away and that's why this retreat uh, has been propped up by Pope Pius XI in uh, December 29th uh, 1929 and his encyclical Mens Nostra it was an encyclical that commemorated his 50th anniversary priestly anniversary at the time mm -hmm. And Pope Pius XI was trying to promote the spiritual exercises because he thought that it was one of the one of the most important things for the spirituality of the world at the time. Uh, looking down a double-barrel shotgun of danger that was coming throughout the years coming. Uh, so anyway, it has so much power because it's so biblical without being the Protestant Bible thumping thing mm -hmm. that's uh, kind of false. Uh, it's it brings us into biblical perspective of everything, brings us so deep into the heart of God, and brings us out as saints. That's why, as I said, Pope Pius XI made uh, St. Ignatius the patron of all Catholic retreats. And so this might get the Carmelites or the Benedictines or whatever all upset. Oh, what are you talking about? You know, we have our own type of retreat to do. <laughs> uh but the Ignatian retreat is so specifically, it's, it's not even Jesuit. It's, it, it's not Jesuit. It's, it is Catholic to the core, and it brings a soul directly into contact with the things of heaven. And we can explain that as we go along, as, we, as you ask me more questions. Is it, wasn't it in the day a requirement for all Catholics to do a retreat in, when, in, during the year, or is, am I off on that? Well, um, for the clergy and religious, yes, <clears throat> you know, mandated. I mean, it wasn't mandated for, for laity. Okay. You know, it would be impossible to, to, to ask the laity to do that. You know, it would be one of the precepts of the church, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but Especially yeah, a 30-day one now. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And the original the, the, the nation retreat was 30 days long. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the grace since my formation in seminary to do eight days every single year since 1989 when oh, wow. I joined the seminary, and I've done that ever since. Uh, and it was only one time in my life that I did the uh, uh, the 30 days, and that was uh, two years before ordination. And so it, it was just absolutely heavenly to do a 30 day because you put everything in perspective, and it just brings everything to light, you know. So I can't imagine coming out of that 30 <laughs> days. <laughs> I can't imagine going in for the first week, but then coming out of it being kind of wanting to be hooked back in type deal. 
Yes. And, and, and what gives us real efficacy is to keep that spirit of silence. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not like you, you do half your day normal and then give yourself a little bit to prayer. No, it's like it's like going into the desert and just rip yourself away from the world and with a very profound silence. And um, so, yeah. Uh, now, I've my experience with the Ignatius retreat has always been kind of, I would say, pre-Vatican too modern. <laughs> uh, in other words, with a preacher, <clears throat> and you have a big group, <clears throat> you may say, excuse me, you may have your your spiritual director there on hand, and then but you kind of go through a group experience, mm-hmm. like you know, keeping the silence, of course, but then going to conferences, you know, all day. That's kind of like the way. It was since the beginning of the 20th century. But the original idea of St. Ignatius was to have uh, a one-on-one retreat. I mean, the retreat treat master could have like 10 people there, but then he would see each individual for like two hours a day. And he would give them all that he needs to know, all his things to think about, and give them that on one-on-one basis. And then the person would break off and, and we'll see him the next 24 hours. And this will go on for like a whole 30 days. Um, I've done that once when I went down, when I was in Louisiana, I, w- I had to do my, my re- nation retreat with the, uh, the Jesuits down there and Grand Coteau. <laughs> and, and there was a specific Jesuit there that I did it with that I was able to trust. I, I didn't really trust too many others there, but uh, he was really good because he was, he was an old timer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he dressed like a lay person and stuff, but, he was he had still that spirit of preaching the hor- the hard stuff it was good <laughs> so it was a good experience and yeah, he did it like that i seen he a couple priests like that i remember going before before i moved to, from denver i went into this one <laughs> church that looked like uh, ikea and i'm walking uh, in and going oh boy here here comes the sermon and he gives a no <laughs> salvation outside the church sermon and i'm looking around going Somebody pinched me. Did I hear that right? <laughs> <laughs> really? That's wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I almost gave it. Went down there and gave him a high five afterwards. So that was quite impressive. Um, <laughs> so, what can people get, or what is what? What would be the? I guess it might be different from everybody else. But what is the main purpose for each person that come into a retreat to pull out of it? Yes. Well, uh, the dynamics of the retreats are as follows. And this is why I'm saying it's so Catholic. It's not just a Jesuit thing. Mm-hmm. It's like it could, it could be comrades can go through it and they can experience all they can get from it just by going through it. So um, it, it's kind of it's kind of broken into three into four weeks. They call it the four weeks of the spiritual exercises. Um, but we can even, you know, people, since we don't do a whole 30 days, we can call it stages. There's like four stages. Um, The first stage is to lay down a principle and foundation. So one wants to get down to the principle foundation, kind of asking oneself with a lot of philosophy, but with a deep spirit of prayer, Mm -hmm. um, what is my purpose of my being? Why am I occupying this skeleton walking around? You know, why why am I on on, on earth? What is my mission on earth? Um, and, um, And I would just like to point out to you, uh, what he says here, and, and it's just one little paragraph, but it can it can bring it can spin the uh, retreat in, into a whole two day of reflection. Just this one paragraph of St. Ignatius it says it says man is created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord, and by means of this, a safe soul. The other things on the face of the earth are created for man to help him in attaining the end for which he is created. Hence, man is to make use of them and as far as they help him in the attainment of his end and this is the uh, punchline he must rid himself of them in as far as they prove a hindrance to him therefore we must make ourselves indifferent and that's the key word indifferent to all created things as far as we're allowed free choice and not under any prohibition Consequently, as far as we are concerned, we should not prefer health to sickness, riches to poverty, honor to dishonor, a long life to a short life. The same holds for all of the things. Our one desire and choice should be what is more conducive to the end for which we are created. 
I mean, you take, you just break down that, that one paragraph. I mean, you got enough to meditate on for like a century, you know, half a century. It's, it's just so powerful. It's so militaristic and it goes right to the core of all the truth that the, the human being can possibly find here, which Christ revealed in his Holy Catholic church. Now, and then so, so that, so it's establishing the principle and foundation. God is my creator. God is my Lord and my God, my maker. Um, and then I, I, I grow in a spirit of dependence. I, I, I'm like attaching myself on to the original intent on why God created everything. It's almost like I'm going to the garden of Gethsemane, uh, the, the garden of, uh, of Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. And I'm in paradise there, the garden of Eden. And it's like, I'm like reliving those first moments before the fall. You know, all the attitudes, I'm, I'm like meditating deeply, uh, like I'm putting my face right into the reality of it, sucking it all in, um, and, and really being retrained to think, uh, be, being retrained to think through the faith, through the dependence in the presence of God, and, and to and know what all that is, to renew all that love that I might miss out through a fall. So anyway, so go through that. So that's like the first stage. Um, and then the second stage is obviously the fall of man. So then you meditate on sin, what sin really is, and all its all its brutal reality, personal sin, the sin of the angels, the sin of Adam and Eve, the sin of uh, just in general, uh, the consequences of sin. So not only the sin itself, uh, individual sin, a personal sin, the original sin, but also to the the famous. Um, um, eternal truths, the four eternal truths, heaven, hell, death. Uh, and, and, and so one meditates on all of that in a very profound way. And, and just to kind of give you an example of that, uh, St. Ignatius then places one in, in the contemplation of different scenarios. He talks about um, reflect on being entrapped in your own being, um, and you're you're wandering around a whole world full of beasts. You know what would that be psychologically, mm-hmm. kind of like consciously? Uh, what what type of fears you would have? What type of type of void from any good things you can possibly experience? Uh, it also brings us. It describes hell, like he says, using all your senses, like your ears, your 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 hearing, your sight, your taste, your smell, be like being in the eternal flames of hell, um, and to to. Ex- to meditate on that, what does that mean? You know, all you have to do is just take uh, Saint Robert uh, Barlamin's um, treatise on hell yeah. in that little that little pocket booklet and just put it in your back pocket. And every time you think about committing a mortal sin, just pull it out <laughs> and read a couple of phrases, and then you'll get the. So it's all this reality. It's like a reality check. You know, you like seeing. Okay, what is sin? Throw away all the, the all the emotional garbage. You know, oh, my uncle Frank can't be in hell and all this stuff. No, like just just black and white just see what things are we're trying to define what things are and, and ignatius is a master at this he just brings us right to reality and seeing what it is you know um and 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 one fun phrase about hell that saint ignatius says that really is very impressive he says meditate on because people are there right now burning away in hell right now uh, and they're there and they're burning away but they have, these people who are burning right now, this second, actually committed less sins than I did. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost like, well, God didn't, didn't God have mercy on me, and he didn't have mercy on them. So it's a whole mystery that he would develop later on, you know, about how God can. But can you imagine people actually burning who've committed less sins than I could, that I have already committed. <laughs> I, I remember and, the uh, Alf- Alphonsus writes about one kid. I think he was like eight, nine years old, who went to hell for one mortal sin, died afterwards. Oh, oh my goodness. And you're thinking, holy cow. <laughs> Just one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think not only St. Alphonse, I think St. Benedict uh, as well talks about that too, is about something like that. It kind of scares the, the living daylights out of us, you know, if we were to take all that just in, in one stride. Uh, so anyway, so going along quickly, I just got to explain the other two um mm-hmm stages of this uh this thing that's very important um 
yeah, it's um, and so so therefore one one has that, that experience of, of one's evil and so forth, the evil of the world, the evil within oneself. Then that brings one to all this. The goal is not to scare us. The goal is to bring us to repentance in Christ. So it brings us to the crucifix. It brings us to a soul that's pouring out his soul to Christ, have, to ask him for mercy. Um, and then, then St. Ignatius suggests that at this point of the, of the retreat, one should make a general confession. Mm-hmm. And so um, a general confession of all one's past life, because he says, in summary, it's not a, it's not a question of going and getting all the details, because St. Ignatius already knows that one has committed a, a, a general confession in the past, perhaps has confessed all these things in the past. But here, since things are so intense, the knowledge the understanding, the gifts of the Holy Ghost that are coming upon me, and the gift of understanding, the gift of knowledge is I'm understanding the eternal truths the way they are, and I'm in this atmosphere of prayer and confidence in God, then my sorrow is an abundance, is, is extreme in this point. So therefore, it's a great moment. It's a great moment of sowing and reaping. And the reaping would be just a place before God, all the sins of my life, especially those who have never made a general confession before, because uh, this retreat was designed for to do it once in a lifetime, and that's it. And it was supposed to make you into a saint after the 30 days. I believe so it. We, yeah, so, so then he emphasizes this thing about the uh, about the general confession and how it helps. Now, since we move on pre-Vatican to modern, uh, we mean uh, that, you know, so a general confession since your last, con- your last general confession. So if you do a yearly retreat, a yearly eight days every year, then you'll be doing it um, so the last 12 months since I last did my general confession, do another general confession. Or if the Holy Ghost can move you, maybe some things that, are, that God has picked it up, new rocks to, that we can look under. Mm-hmm. Um, one might be inspired to just say some more stuff, even though one's made a general confession in the past. So with that renewal, one faces a, a crossroads. One's like in a fork in a road. And, and therefore, the soul is now asking itself, okay, now that I've, I understand exactly what, what God's plans is over, over our, my life, over the world, I know that I failed, and I know that now that God has forgiven me, and it is a ex- tremendous experience of God's mercy at this point. There's a, there's a certain love that just comes over the soul, uh, just profound, that you normally would not experience otherwise. Mm-hmm. It's a very deep, into the sacrament of confession, into the into the depths of meditation uh, and all spirit of love and humility. And so the soul is saying, okay, I can go out and conquer the world. Now I am renewed. I have this tremendous gift of God's grace and so forth. Um, But then the soul says, okay, well, I'm called now to the heights. How, how can I maintain this purity of mind and heart? And how can I continue to persevere in it? Although I have to go back to a broken world uh, on Monday morning, you know, <laughs> so, so therefore the retreat says, okay, now we need to go and you need to fill yourself with Christ. Christ will be your way, your truth in your life, right? So Christ will be the way you will be the vehicle by which you can succeed and be, maintain the fervor and become a, and, and become a saint. And so therefore the soul then, um, is presented with the incarnation of God. So first of all, first, before it goes into that third stage, um, it it it, um, it really wants you to get an experience of trust in Christ, that Christ is calling you, the call of Christ, so therefore the temporal king. So that's one meditation to introduce you into the um, incarnation reflection. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this temporal king, you have to understand the times of St. Ignatius, so therefore he's a very, he's from the 16th century, he's all about chivalry, he, he himself was a general or whatever, he was an army, army officer, before his conversion and so he understood all this and plus at the same time they were, at, that, at that century they were kicking the muslims out of all of spain mm-hmm. and so so therefore saint ignatius he kind of paint, uh, paints this picture of christ the temporal king like he he says imagine a king that's so full of majesty so full of pomp so full of self-confidence and he's out in the balcony and he's addressing the christian peoples and he's he's he, he's, I mean, he's gathering all the commitment of an entire people, no matter what walk of life. They're all like hanging on his every word. And, and he gives you this image. He says, that's Christ. Christ is doing that right now. 
he's, he's attracting you to this 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 tremendous imp- enterprise that cannot be left aside. And if you would leave it aside, then you would be feel guilty for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, it's almost like he's using all this, all these these chivalrous things to really, but but not just trying to trap you into something that he believes in, but that is absolutely real. I mean, this God is just about to come out of heaven. He's about to drop out of heaven and he's going to shift all the paradigms of all, everything, and you're the protagonist with him. He's trying to get you involved in it. So that's a very beautiful uh, reflection. The incarnation is also very beautiful because he, he also paints the picture of the times during the times of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Jesus came, um, you know, Romans chapter 1, the state of the world at the time of, of Christ's coming. So all this evil, everybody's running away from the laws of nature. Everybody's their own anarchists. Um, everybody's doing this and that and the other. So even uh, there's a book out there too that be, before I forget about it that people should read, and that's by um, Father Harden. It, it's called The Retreat. Um, the Retreat, and uh, it's it's a good book because it really stays focused on the original intent of sitting Ignatius. Hmm. I think it was published back in 1980, even though it's a post-Vatican II book, but it's really well done uh, because, like I say. Uh, I've been doing this since '89. I didn't. I never heard of Father Harden until late, you know, later on. Yeah, he um, was great in general. Yeah, he was. He was good in, in general. But but it, this, what surprised me was when I when I finally under, got that book and I read it for the first time. This was like in 2011. I was like, wow, that's everything I've been doing. Like you know, because we, we were pretty faithful. To, we stuck to the original Ignatian uh, spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, the incarnation. Um, so he describes in Romans chapter one and, and describing all this evil. And it's like there's a council in heaven between the three persons of the Holy Trinity. And they're describing what they see. And they says, we see white men. We see black men. We see people in war. We see people in peace. We see all these people doing all their things, doing humdrum things, doing extraordinary things. They're all there participating in the life of society. And they're all going to hell. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a very powerful description. So they were watching and, the news recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, they're all going to hell. But uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, right? So God loves the world so much. So among this holy trinity and in, 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 inside of a council discussing what they're going to do about the situation, right? He's just using human human terminology for it yeah. to describe the reality uh then the whole the second person holy trinity is being sent for this purpose and mm-hmm. what's so dynamic about this is that uh there is a very specific uh thing of saint ignatius uh the triple petition mm-hmm. becomes so important and he says from now on this the rest of this retreat is going to be contemplation of christ to receive these graces and it's going to be um to acquire an intimate knowledge of christ who became man for me so this knowledge and through this knowledge without any options is going to bring me to an intimate personal <clears throat> profound love for him this love for Christ that will bring me then to a third step that will bring me into a total and absolute following of Christ, a commitment to Christ. So that triple thing based on scholastic philosophy from St. Thomas Aquinas Mm -hmm. is absolutely important in order to get the fruits of a a true authentic retreat because it's just, it's, it's analyzing the truth about man, right? We cannot love what we do not know, Mm -hmm. And we cannot follow what we do not love, right? We have to love something first, someone first, in order to commit ourselves to that person. So it's going very deep into the very nature of man and revealed in Christ. And so therefore, uh, so the, 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 the petition, the, the pleading, so even with squinted eyes and clenched fists, begging for hours and hours and begging that God will grant this grace to be able to understand. And it's not just a book understanding. 
it's like the biblical understanding. So you're actually really touching the thing. You're touching this reality. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's what it's being all about. Uh, it's in, and in Spanish we have this very good because in English we kind of lose it when we say I want to know Christ. Uh, but in Spanish they keep it because it's the it's the Latin way of saying conoscere, conocer in Spanish, which means it could mean a various different thing. It can also it means intellectual, but it also goes beyond the intellectual to the tangible. Okay. It's tangible. Like for example, if I if I say I want to visit a city, in English I would say I'm going to visit Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Spanish you would say voy a conocer a Kansas City. I'm going to I'm going to know it. Yes. <laughs> I'm actually going to keep my my feet are going to actually touch, you know, the street there. That makes sense. Uh, yeah? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense than just yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, so 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 this is the power behind and this is this wraps up the whole experience of the Spanish medieval mysticism, right? Saint Saint Teresa of Avila, Saint John of the Cross, Saint Ignatius of Loyola and many others. Um it's 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 so it's so crucial to the entire because you see the Protestants can exploit this really easily you know and and because everything is just feeling so we're not talking about a feeling good thing um, and so therefore Catholics kind of shy away from that type of baloney right we, we don't like that type of stuff where we kind of you know feely goody thing no but it's it's it, it is an intellectual thing, but then it goes quickly into the heart. It moves, it drags the heart with it. It becomes operative. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a knowledge that, that is enticing to the very core of our, our being, our nature. It's a, it's a, it's a knowledge that's true knowledge, um, but it, it, it's a mystical experience. I don't know how else to say it, um, but it's very, very profound. And it's very authentic and and that's 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 what's being pursued here in this stage, and and through the life of Christ, this is what it will, will will be the thing. So then, as meditations on on uh, the birth of our Lord, so nativity of our Lord, and it, and it's very very graphic. He wants us to be graphic. So therefore, the, the the type of prayer here, and for the rest of the retreat, is contemplative, mm-hmm. um, meaning that you use all your senses to bring yourself into the prayer. And the prayer of the heart, above all, above uh, the prayer of affection, uh, and not just verbal and vocal prayer, and then coming to the true resolutions from there. Uh, so this will bring it, and he wants us all to meditate some med- some things in the life of Christ. So therefore, you know, you got the baptism. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here, but I'm going quick. Right, right, right. Uh, so, so you have a lot. Of, you're going through the life of Christ with, with these same fruits in mind, with these same uh, uh, things that we're praying for. Um, and then that brings you to, and um, right there with the um, the passion and death of Christ. So this will be considered like the f- the, the the fourth, like I, third, uh, second part of third stage, and then the fourth stage, the spiritual side. So the death, a passion and death of our Lord, and the resurrection of Christ. Okay. So then, so then you um, and then here is like you put what we spoke about entering into the incarnation into the life of christ put that on steroids <laughs> it's like he's, he's like using the phrase of saint paul i am crucified with christ i am risen with christ but that with is not just uh, a a senseless word it's like you're there yeah he wants you to be there and you experience all the great sorrows of christ you go deep into the garden of gethsemane you go it's like you're there living it out firsthand through, through God's grace, through this contemplative prayer. And, and all of this is meant, um, okay, let me back up a little bit. And then so you can imagine. So that, that's kind of the contemplative part of these four stages. With Inside this second stage, you know, the, the life of Christ stage, then you have a ver- couple of meditations that are very important. The two flags are very, two very standards. important. So, yeah, two standards. So, yeah. so the sitting nations are preparing the mind. Mm-hmm for the battle to come to become a saint to become one with christ so he's preparing uh the mind so in other words he's trying to show you what the two armies are like there's nothing in between there's no mediocrity there's no a uh, catholic light um no fence so <laughs> yeah it's either it's either all or nothing it's either you're for christ or you're for the devil there's no in-betweens there and so then he, he kind of explains the psychology of what it means to belong 
to the army. Now, this is before the age of psychology, right? So we're not talking about psychology the way we mean it today, right? Uh, we're just trying to try get into the mind of one who's trying to make an option for life that means everything. Um, and so therefore the devil is, he's like, has a, he has his little pep rally. So he, he goes to these images of, there he is in Babylon having a powwow with all his, uh, with all his warriors. And he's saying, go out to the whole world and recruit and go and recruit and use the methodology, you know, which would be um, to bring them riches and, and that would be like the bait and bringing them in. Then you give them all kinds of honors. And then this will be this will where pride will be born. And from pride, then you can conquer them in every other vice possible. Now, now, Jesus, he will use the recruiting method totally different when he's rallying his troops. He says, you go out and you present to them poverty, right? Detachment from things, that, that holy indifference that we spoke about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, go out there and convince them to give up the, the, the riches uh, so that they uh, could really propel themselves uh, in loving dishonors and loving sacrifice and mortifications and so forth. And this brings a soul to an act of humility. And from humility, if the soul then makes an act of humility truly and permanently, then, of course, uh, this will open a door for every other virtue possible and every virtue that that soul is called to right and so so therefore he's really preparing the mind he's trying to say okay if we, you're going to get involved in this enterprise but well, we want to make sure that you know what's at stake here what's the battle um okay and then there's another another meditation in the three types of um uh, classes of men uh, which is the Los Tres Binarios in the original medieval Spanish of St. Ignatius. Me literally means the three um, three stooges or <laughs> these three types of, pen, of men. Mm -hmm. uh, and and these, these three, three types of generosity are very, very important uh, because what it's trying to do is is trying to tell you, okay, the, the soul has inordinate attachments from one's because of one's fallen nature okay so i have the inordinate attachments he uses the thing the riches his whole thing was about riches and poverty right but you can apply it to anything across the board any sort of disorder uh, so therefore you have an attachment to a sum of money that you acquired unjustly well uh the soul wants to get rid of it but it doesn't know how and it wants to it wants to do it in order to be good with god it wants to get rid of this inordinate attachment to the sum of money and so therefore you have three types of ways of doing it. The first way would be, I really want to get rid of this evil within me. I want to, I want to conform my life to Christ. I want to get rid of the um, unjust acquiring of this money, mm -hmm. but death comes first before I do anything <laughs> before I actually make any improvement. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not really. When it, I just give myself over to just coasting along in life, right. Without doing anything, without putting in the means, in order to affect it and the second type of person is the one who goes midway so i really want to i really want to improve i want to be a saint i want to do all this stuff but then i'm gonna make god come to me mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna make i'm gonna have middle ground with him I'm gonna make a deal it's like a compromise right so he's gonna he's gonna go to a certain level but when the when the when the going really goes tough he's gonna give up the project you know he's gonna kind of give up uh, and then you have the person, the last uh, type of person uh, who makes an honest decision. And it doesn't mean that he's going to become angelic. It doesn't mean that he's going to get rid of, totally throw out all of his inordinate attachment. But it means that he's going to be sincere with himself and he's going to do everything possible uh, knowing that he's going to act as if the, 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 the inordinate attachment was undone. Mm -hmm. um, and he's going to make these, these uh, steps, these strides, uh, trusting that it was already undone, and he's going to remain himself indifferent to whatever God may say about the whole issue. So in other words, St. Ignatius had, the, had the, the, the visual that the soul the person was attached to a, a, a 10,000 ducats, mm -hmm. okay? And he acquired that in a dark alley. He saw a suitcase, and he saw, oh, I got this money all of a sudden. It's not his, and he's trying to get rid of it. But then he says, 
there's going to be such an in, indifferent to the whole matter that he's going to be satisfied with whatever God decides. Whether he decides me to give up the money or if God finally decides, okay, well, losers, you know, you find it, you keep it, right? Mm-hmm. So God might say, okay, you might keep that um, money, but as long as as long as it's God's will that I'm going to keep it or not keep it, you know. Um, so therefore, it means that I'm just available. So that's the whole word. It doesn't mean that I'm going to become an angelic saint when it comes to my faults and defects and my inordinate attachments. But I'm going to be so extremely open to just plan my life moving forward the way God wants it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then there's whole there's like little follow ups about that, about how he's going to do a colloquy on this and that and the other to to get that optimal disposition of the soul, the availability of the soul there. OK. And then the last one. of, And then we'll fi- finalize the whole thing here. With that, that last question would be the three types of humility. Right. And, and it's also here again. It's very, very beautiful because. Uh, so therefore, St. Ignatius earlier was preparing the mind for the mission mm-hmm. or, or the lifestyle with Christ. Then he was preparing the heart, the generosity. Mm-hmm. And he's preparing the heart again with the humility, the three modes of humility. So the first mode was <clears throat> that I humble and abase myself as much as is possible for me in order that I may obey in all things the law of God our Lord Accordingly, I would not give consideration to the thought of breaking any commandment, divine or human, that binds me under the pain of mortal sin, even though this offense <clears throat> would make me master of all creation or would preserve my life on earth. <clears throat> so he says that, in other words, all of this boils down to this, I would not break any of the commandments. I, I prefer death than to commit a single mortal sin. That's the first degree of humility. And he says, this is this is so essential that we cannot even be saved without this minimal level of humility. Uh, and then he says, the second way of humility is more perfect than the first. He says, I am in possession of it, and my state of mind is such that I neither desire nor either prefer to have riches rather than poverty, to seek honor rather than dishonor, to have a long life or rather than a short one, mm-hmm. provided that here be the same opportunity to serve God our Lord and to save my soul. And nor would I, for the sake of all creation or for the purpose of saving my life, consider committing a single venial sin. So the second second degree of humility is that I would prefer death than to commit a single uh, venial sin willingly, a deliberate venial sin. And then the third, so if you thought that was, <laughs> you know, and then so the third, the third level degree of humility is the most perfect, he says, and, and this exists when the first degree and the second degree of humility is already attained and possessed. Okay, you already have to have those down pat first. And the praise and the glory of divine majesty being equally served. I desire and choose poverty with Christ rather than the riches in order to be more like Christ our Lord. When I choose reproaches with Christ, the suffering rather than honor, and when I am willing to be considered as worthless and a fool for Christ, who suffered such treatment before me, rather than be esteemed as wise and prudent in this world. And, and there and there you see the tremendous it's like don't try this at home type stuff. This is he even puts notes in there saying that, you know, you have to be chosen for this. You have to discern about it. And this is a whole other thing. Like if you want to ask me a question later about discernment, because discernment for St. Ignatius is so important. Not the Pope Francis discernments, uh, but true Ignatian discernment. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just imagine that it's like, you know, yes. Uh, fire me where I can be destitute, you know, (laughs) I can have my whole family in destitution. It's almost like, this is almost like the longs of lines of of thought that he's actually discreetly suggesting, which is so (laughs) like, don't try this stuff at home stuff. It has to be something where it has to be a, a tremendous manifestation of the Holy ghost 
and it has to be abundantly clear. Clear, um, and it's it's not so much that I'm searching for it, you know, because I as a as a father and as a, a husband and a, and a family, I do have to provide for my family. You know, I have to pray for my family. I have to make sure that family succeeds. So this stuff, I'm not I'm not looking for this just to kind of to mimic the life of Christ in such a degree. But don't worry. Even when you're providing for your family, you will find abundant amount of possibilities of being humiliated for Christ, mm -hmm. uh, as every husband and every uh, father of family knows <laughs> of those different points. But anyway, that's the going beyond the point. So anyway, that's in a nutshell is what I had to say about the dynamics of all the retreat. So, so yeah, if y'all ain't had done the retreat yet, you can. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go to one. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I've met many priests who knows they've been to Father's uh, retreats, and they say it's, it's changed their lives. So, wow, really? is yeah. should it should this be kind of like a a GK Chesterton motto? If anything we're doing is we're doing badly, you don't care what retreat you go to, as long as you go to Ignatius style. Is that kind of like the thing? You know, I wouldn't even go that far. You know it. As long as these dynamics are being taken place, mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be an Ignatian retreat. You know what I'm saying? Like these dynamics of profound encounter with, with, with how, how does God think of evil, um, the profound love that he has that he actually gives himself to me right now mm -hmm. and through the incarnation, mm -hmm. that he's with me, he has my back, he reveals himself. So all these essential elements of Christianity – as long as they're there, who cares about all this uh, red tape stuff mm -hmm. of an Ignatius retreat? You know what I'm saying? So that's why it, that's why I love it so much because it's not even Jesuit. It's just it's just like throwing yourself into the biblical times. It's like becoming, you know, a Joseph, a patriarch, or becomes a Saint Paul. Like you live that life. So basically, like you your know? daily meditation, just do that part. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, daily meditation. I mean, that every retreat's going to have that aspect to it anyway, unless you're kind of a yoga style stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about discernment. Um, I'm always discernment. one of those to ask. Uh, I remember what was that? What was that? There was a sermon that Father did. It was on Ignatius, uh, how to make a decision, and it was one of the things was asking so many people about the two ideas. And another one was with, uh, what would you do if you saw yourself come up on the street? What would you tell yourself in that situation? I remember telling my spiritual director, don't ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, the this, this sermon of spirits is, is so important and I think it's beautiful, but it takes a while to kind of for it to set in because it is kind of deep. You know, and so uh, you have to have a good, a good spiritual director in order to really kind of make this thing gel one who knows who they're talking about so here here's the gist of it so he gives kind of two descriptions of discernment mm -hmm. by giving some definitions first too to kind of define his terms so the first thing would be um for though he recommends these rules which is the rules 313 to 327 of his uh, ignatius spiritual exercises manual that he wrote um and um, <clears throat> so he directs a certain amount of rules for beginners, mm -hmm. those who are beginners in the spiritual life or beginners in the retreat that don't really know much about the spiritual life. And he gives another set of rules um, for those who are advanced, more advanced in their spiritual experience. Um, and so here, here's kind of a nutshell of how this works. So he says, okay, let's first of all define our terms. So first of all, there's an evil spirit and there's a good spirit. Mm -hmm. He says, what are these two things? The, the evil spirit is either the devil or disordered conscience or anything that's anti-holy, anti, you know, anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that, that brings me to God direct, you know, truly and really. So it could be any any of those things. It could be inside of myself, or it could be the devil it's himself. So that's what's labeled evil spirit. And then a good spirit is God, and that means, you know, the Holy Trinity. It doesn't mean the uh, Muslim God and so forth. It means, you know, the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, it could either mean the angels, 
the good angels, guardian angel and so forth, St. Michael and all that. Or it could be the mind and the will guided by divine grace. You know, so so that's that's what he labels a good spirit. Mm -hmm. Now he says, okay, now now within a mortal sin, how does how do these two spirits work on a soul when someone finds themselves in a mortal sin? It says ordinarily the evil spirit ordinarily suggests pleasures and fills the imagination with the sensual and delights, keeping them in their vices and increasing the number of their sins. So that's how the evil spirit works on the soul of someone who's in a mortal sin, mm -hmm. state of mortal sin. And then a good spirit, when someone's in a mortal sin, a state of mortal sin, how does a good spirit work on a person for him to discern? He rouses the sting of conscience, you know, like beating him up, you know, slapping him around, so to speak. Uh, and he fills him with uh, remorse of conscience. So those basically, and that, that's all we can say about those two things. That's like the basics of the basics, right, of how we should discern mm -hmm. what something's from God or something's not from God. Um, it's pretty easy when you're in a state of mortal sin <laughs> you know, of, of how to of how to get out of evil and get to the good, right? So uh, it's very basic, and it's, but you'd be surprised how people would even linger around doubts with that, you know. Uh, now, especially nowadays, and then he says, "Okay, now what happens when someone goes to confession and actually puts himself back into a state of grace? You know, living a life of grace." Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about those who are kind of like the revolving door, like going in and out of mortal sin every two minutes, you know, <laughs> uh, going to confessional. <clears throat> no, I'm talking about someone who's really serious and is actually starting to simmer down and settling down in life mm -hmm. and, and trying to live up, you know, <clears throat> live a life of grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the evil, so he says, okay, well, how does the evil spirit work and how does a good spirit work with someone who's in the, kind of a newly founded spiritual life uh, where the evil spirit starts to vex and harass and stings and afflicts with sadness to the soul. Right? Like he's missing all this stuff in the past. So he, that's what he does. That's his main thing is to do is to just kind of get the guy uh, restless. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the good spirit is it encourages, strengthens, sometimes as a gift of tears um, there's sorrow for sin, there's peace, there's inspiration that makes the burdens light and removes obstacles, right, to get to the next virtue, to get to make virtues easy and so forth. So there, therefore, he's, that's a very important definition to get the basics down for discernment. And then he goes to the next. Yep, go ahead. No, it's funny you mentioned tears. I just heard a lecture and uh, <laughs> they talked about Gregory, the theologian, talking about another form of baptism. He called it the fifth was the person that cried tears baptized him every night it was oh, soaking wow. in his sheets and went, wow, oh my that's goodness a, that's a pretty good idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully yeah and, and that's important because um uh, the next the next concept he, he defines is is spiritual consolations and desolations mm -hmm. that's very important for him and that'll be very important for discernment later on um he, he says that spiritual consolation, so he says, what is a spiritual consolation? He says, interior movement, not to be mistaken for feelings, mere feelings, mm -hmm. but interior movement stirred in the depths of the soul and flamed with love for its creator and Lord. So love anything, not for its own sake, but only in relation with his creator and Lord. This could be sorrow for sins, meditation on the passion of Christ, and tears could come now it's very important i mean people this is kind of like a break away from modern thought because people say well how can i be consoled if i'm sorrowful <laughs> you know because that's so the ignatian consolation is very different from the way we think about consolations in other words it means anything that brings you to the truth anything that keeps you in the truth anything that keeps you in christ and uh his church Right, Any, anything like that, even if it hurts, that's considered a co consolation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it could be a, it could be our type of consolation, or it could be a, even our own desolation. The way we think about desolations, right? So, um, so why do we have to go through desolations? 
So the desolations, um, but hold on. Oh, yeah, and then we got to define spiritual desolation. Um, it is the opposite, he says, of spiritual consolation. It's darkness of the soul. It's turmoil. Mm -hmm. It's inclining to whatever is earthly, the restlessness, disturbedness, temptations, and so forth. Any lack of faith, any lack of hope, any lack of charity, slothful, tepid, sad, separated from his creator. So anything that goes along those lines would be considered um, a spiritual desolation. Okay. Would there be a time limit in all that, or would that just be like any just you wake up and you just feel like you're in a rut and would that count yeah, as that well, or something else? Well, it does count as that, but now he's he's really just trying to lay down a basis, the foundation of of states of mind mm -hmm. rather than just little moments. But it, it would not ex totally exclude little moments because it, it could be it could be a manifest because because he he's with the un understanding that we are always going through depending on what how God governs the soul, mm -hmm. we're constantly navigating through constellations and desolations back and forth frequently. Even he would even say, but everyone there's everyone goes through it differently okay mm -hmm. so it's not like one one size fits all you know um so here's some spiritual pointers with this about this um he says try not to make any decisions in a state of desolation uh when one passes from desolation to consolation frequently back and forth it says try to stay grounded on your previous resolutions when you had a longer mind frame of spiritual consolation mm -hmm. you know um and he says why is this because he says the good spirit leads in consolation and a bad spirit leads in desolation and so that's very important you know it's very important so they say that is he he's not saying every mathematically 100 percent sure every time mm -hmm. but but there's a general pattern that he's noticed is that this is the way the evil spirit works? Because in other words, we want to follow the good spirit, but avoid the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, uh, we 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 want to be anything that brings us to the good spirit um, in our decision makings and our choices in life. You know, whether you're choosing your spouse, mm -hmm. whether you're choosing a vocation, whether it's religious life, a married life, or whether it's moving away with your family to go go to another state. Uh, that you're perplexed, you don't know the answer, you're trying to figure it out, you're trying to talk it over with your wife, you don't know if I should make the move or not. You'll be amazed how this way of discernment could actually clarify a lot of stuff for any given soul about any choices, especially the beefy choices that, that people have to make mm -hmm. that are important, that life changes, uh, they're important decisions for one's rest of one's life. They will be paying the consequences for the rest of one's life. So it's good to be attracted to the good spirit and avoid the evil spirit when discerning. And so what to do? Um, he says that uh, to intensify activity against desolation. So that, so when one finds himself in, 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 in a desolation, mm -hmm. one should increase all the activities that goes along with a consolation. <laughs> So in other words, you know, we said that when one is bombarded by temptations mm -hmm. and one is, is disturbed and saddened, that could be like dragging the soul down. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to be doing my meditation, uh, doing it as if everything was whistle clear, you know, as if I was in a state of. So the more we have this type of going up against the grain, mm -hmm. the more I'm going to be so open to that good spirit that I will make always the right choice and the, the God-based choices that I need to make with almost razor-sharp precision. Uh, now, that's the ideal, right? It, it, it goes even trickier as you get along because the devil is not going to give up, right? Uh, but so so that's like the, the principle. Make sure you have all the consolation stuff going on when you are overwhelmed by desolations, when you when you feel like giving up, mm -hmm. keep at it. Keep going back to the drawing board. Keep at you. Don't give up your prayer. Don't give up your rosary. Don't give up your your stuff, your virtues, and all that. 
because you're going to prevail. It's going to get stronger. You're, you're clinging to the good spirit and therefore God's will. And I think that's a little caveat that I maybe forgot to say at the beginning, a premise. He says that God's will is everything for us. It's a matter between life and death. But we're not as privileged as the Blessed Mother to see an archangel appear to us to tell us, you know, you're going to be <laughs> this or that. So he said, that's why we have to discern because we don't have the power. Help, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't have powers to have visions of the angels telling us what we're supposed to do at every two seconds. Yeah. So therefore, uh, to have that, to, to be with God's will, we have to go through these discernments of spirits um, because it's the only way that we're able to actually uh, recuperate peace and be within God's will, right? Um, okay, so uh, another thing is, he says that that know that God permits the bad spirit to tempt us many times. Um, with God's grace, we can resist the evil spirit uh, and also know that love is hidden and also know that God's grace is sufficient for salvation. So even though it's, it might be frequent, especially when one is progressing in the spiritual life, becoming holier and holier, God may permit the evil spirit to uh, attack us more. Mm -hmm. All of these uh, things that we spoke about, either the devil or the things within us, the passions, the, the lower self coming up and trying to bite us again. So we need to, we need to persevere in patience. He says, know that in desolation, when we're in a state of desolation, know that the consolation is around a corner. Um, fight in desolation as if you were in consolation. Kind of, we explained that just now. Um, he says, and then we say, ask, he asks a question, why do we have to go through the desolations? Why do we have to do this? Uh, the spiritual desolations. He says, at times it's our own fault. <laughs> he says that tepid and slothful and our attitude and piety could cause it if we're just being mediocre. We can, we can cause it through our own fault, uh, sowing what we reap in this area. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that God wants to see how authentic our love is. In other words, he's testing our love, where our love can come out, where it's not going to be all easy. He rewards. Rewards are usually awaiting those who praise and love God even though they are deprived of consolations. And that's why God will, because it would be greater rewards, right? And then the last point of why he says that God um, permits it is that God is trying to teach us. Trying to teach us not in our power to attain unto consolation and their benefits and privileges. He says the gift of tears, for example, is just that. It's a gift, so sometimes he would withdraw them so that we can value them more and we can we can have a humble spirit. Like we're not going to be like these masters of, oh, I'm always in consolation, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or And also our spiritual life cannot be based on vanity or um, our own glory. I remember okay? uh, there was a quote by uh, that St. Anthony is in one of the books. Uh, I want to say it was the one by the, uh, who's the saint that wrote the book on him? Was it St. Anthony? Uh, or Saint Augustine. I just went stupid. Anyway, it was quoting <laughs> about uh, Anthony's getting pounded by demons, and Anthony oh, tells yeah. our Lord, "Where were you? Where were you this time?" And his response from God is, "I wanted to see how you could fight." <laughs> well, that's a cool yeah. statement. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely, and it's it's so it's so wise, right? You would never want to put a, a a veteran quarterback out there if he's not veteran. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You, you wouldn't want to put him out there if he doesn't know all the, the, the tricks of the trade and so forth. And you can only do that by going through it, experiencing it, experiencing the opposition mm -hmm. uh, to be able to endure. Okay, well, um, yeah, this is it. And I'm getting to the, 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 the very essence of this discernment stuff because it's very useful for people. It keeps people at peace, I think. Mm -hmm. um, he says there's a, there's a, he said he has a word about evil spirits. He says that um, he gives some examples. He said, the evil spirit, you have to watch out for him because he's like a woman, he said. Uh, he says, this is before the time of the feminist movement, you know, <laughs> weakness, right? So he's like, she, and if he is weak, comes out, she comes out in her rage and vindictiveness. So the evil spirit's just like that. So if you're not strong, 
if you show all your chinks in your armor, you show all your, uh, you know, just kind of giving up and being like a bowl of jello, mm -hmm. wobbling around, then the evil spirit's going to gobble you up, right? I think St. Teresa of Avila has a lot on that, too. She speaks about the same thing. But yet, if you're strong, you put him, you put him on, his, on his heels. He starts running away. He starts to flee. Um, um, and so... And then he, then he even uses a, a, an image of a, a, a lover who tries to seduce a 15-year-old girl, right? Mm -hmm. He says, once, once the father hears about it, her father, then all his success dwindles and fades away. So in other words, this is a, a little aspect about spiritual direction, right? So the more you, you, get, you, you tell your father about the struggles that you have and the thing, the dangers that you're coming upon and all this stuff, mm -hmm. the lesser the evil spirit will have grip on you. It will kind of let you go, right? The more you kind of, because, you know, if you let a father know, if the girl knows that her father knows, then the lover's going to go move on. He's going to go go look after somebody else, go after someone else instead of her. Or he says, that's also like a general in army who tries to attack on all sides and gets he gets to the weakest point. Um, and when he s discovers that e weakest point, then that's when he pours in all his army and that hole in the gap uh, of the walls of the the uh, the battle. Um, and then then lastly, uh, he just speaks about um, the rules for those who are in illuminative stage, right? Those who are more advanced, because that's that's when it starts getting tricky. And I think that's when a lot of people has prob they have problems on how to discern life. Because you know a lot of us are kind of far along. You know, we've been we've been at this for years, trying to do God's will, and we've had our experiences of resolutions and consolations, spiritual consolations. But then there comes a point where the real battle starts happening, right? <laughs> uh, he said, "Okay, what's the characteristics on an advanced or saintly person of the good spirit and the bad spirit? How does it, how do they act?" He says, "The good spirit is God or the angels and so forth, or the grace within me." Uh, the acting upon a soul to give true peace and banish sadness, but the e but the bad spirit, the evil spirit, or the demons fight such happiness from the good spirit, and so he sets up traps and subtleties. He can even take on the good spirit appearances. That's that's the novelty to this, mm -hmm. and deceptions and fallacious reasoning. So, so therefore, the discernment. He says, "Look at this." He says. God alone can give true joy. It's God with no previous cause. So when when all this peace comes upon us, when there's really no previous cause for it, you can know that that's coming straight from God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you're in a spiritual consolation, and it really doesn't come from any cause, like there's not a dramatic thing that happens to you and all of a sudden it's like it's organic, right? You like that word organic? <laughs> It's like, it's like, you know, it's coming from God. Um, and that's a very important point to really check the pulse, right? When one's saying, okay, when I'm making these decisions, when I'm like, am I at peace with this or that and the other? It's important to see, okay, where, where are the causes coming from, you know? Now, the devils can give sadness without any previous cause. So if God does it for peace, Without any previous causes, it comes from God. Mm -hmm. Well, without any previous causes, uh, sadness is, is present without any cause, and that comes from the demon. That comes from the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. And you'll be amazed uh, how the things can change so quickly. Um, you know, I remember one person was going to go to a retreat, and um, and it was a he was on a fence. He didn't know if he wanted to go on a retreat or not. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, like on his way, he finally made the decision that he was going to go. And all of a sudden, he started having all his friends call him up and just started cursing him out, you know, <laughs> like, like just screaming at him, like, where are you going? What are you doing? And the wife started calling and started screaming at him. So he, it's like, like, these are like no previous cause. Like people don't usually don't behave this way with me. He said, you know, <laughs> it just came out of nowhere, you know, just like all these all these uh, attacks they were attacked it was just, the devil was trying to discourage him from going oh wow and, and and so the devil was just 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 all this this from no previous uh cause 
all of a sudden had all these flare-ups. You couldn't, so he knew, explained to him later, that that was not from God. That was God wanted you on the retreat. That's why he he, he trying to discourage you through all these screams of, <laughs> of, of your loved ones, you know. Yeah, he's probably uh, not going to send those kind of calls. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's kind of spooky stuff, you know, it could be, but uh, that's the reality. Um, and so let me see, let me see. I think there's one couple of last points here about that. Um, so both the good spirit and the evil spirit can give, in parentheses, a consolation to the soul at this advanced stage of the spiritual life. But it's very important uh, that there is a different purpose behind the consolation. So in other words, St. Ignatius will invite someone to think, to think through the beginning, the middle, and the end of what this consolation is giving me, with this idea that's supposed to be filled with peace and so forth. Analyze it all the way through. I mean, it is just obviously clear post-Vatican II. Uh, I mean, there's examples everywhere of what not to do. <laughs> okay. Like, for example, I don't know, someone comes up with the idea of uh, altar girls, right? Alt altar girl boys. Uh, so the altar girls who are trying to be boys, uh, they they are there, and someone comes up with a good idea. It's, it's actually nice. It could be very peaceful. It could be actually very good. It could be um, something that we would want to look into because the girls – get very close to the Eucharist. They're participating in a very special way and they themselves personally become very consoled, can probably grow in grace and increase prayer and who knows, become a nun afterwards or whatever. All because she was closer to the altar. But then, okay, so that's, that's like a short-term consolation, like, a, a, like the devil, like a smoke screen. Mm -hmm. But then as we keep analyzing it, all of a sudden, uh, the boys are walking away because they don't want to be with girls because we know how all the psychology at that age works. They, you know, okay, the girls want to run everything. They can take care of it. I'm, I'm out, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so the, the boys disappear. Like my boyhood, my boyhood parish, that same thing happened. Uh, we used to be uh, 90 to 100, 100, 120, 130 boys, mm -hmm. uh, all the boys. We had the little school teg pegged on to the parish. Uh, when my, my pastor retired, he said, do not do it. Overnight, the new pastor brought in all the girls, and the boys were gone. To this day, there's no boys. And you still have the school pegged on to the uh, <laughs> to the church, uh, and there's no – so anyway. And a lot of vocations so I, come from that. A lot, of, a lot of priestly vocations come from altar serving. Yeah, so that that's the whole question. Uh, the nitwits have to, have to analyze, uh, okay, beginning – middle and after so if we look at all the way through we have to see that the end is definitely from the devil because we losing all the priests and only pre only boys can become men men and only men can become boys i mean uh become priests mm -hmm. and so therefore this is a fallacy this is a almost a, a, a an abuse on the girls trying to trying to train them the, the desire for priesthood by being so close and so forth. so you can see that something that started off very very it's a great idea it's, a, it's spiritual something good to come out of it and all of a sudden it bites you and it turns into hell i mean it turns into um the obvious right mm -hmm. so anyway that's basically about the discernment of spirits so you got a book uh i got the pdf for uh <laughs> what oh, is, you got just one chapter <laughs> right is it more of a because i haven't been able to read it yet i've been doing so many of these videos uh, is it more like a kind of like we just did a guide about what a spirit, what is Ignatius retreat or a retreat in general? Is that kind of the gist of it? No. Well, we'll start, well, obviously, I'm still trying to get a publisher for it, so I haven't even started the process yet. But um, what I'm what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to my audience is kind of like a person who's aware of the spirituality already, mm -hmm. the dynamics and the nuts and bolts of the spiritual exercises, but. It's kind of a tool for them to actually do the actual contemplations. It's like bringing the person into the meditations. Mm -hmm. Now, I do describe um, methodology, you know, just to say, okay, this is what the fruit we're looking for. But my main focus is trying to put that person into prayer. 
So it's like a, it's trying to get them, trying to bring them into a retreat. So in other words, if someone wants to actually do a retreat and doesn't have anybody to give it to them, mm-hmm. like you have to get a person, he's, nobody's giving it to them, would that person just take the book, go off in a cabin by a lake somewhere for eight days and do it by themselves mm-hmm. by going through the, by going through the chapters, you know? Oh, very good. Okay. Yeah. The actual prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Father, this was a uh, fantastic, uh, that this, we went about an hour and 10 and I felt like it went about 15 minutes. So that was, thank you very oh my much God, for the that. whole hour already. Oh, oh yeah. Wait, we're past an hour. That sounds great. <laughs> I wasn't going to stop. I was going to keep it, let him go. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can I get a, All can right. we get a final blessing and uh, let you go? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, Benedicto de omnipotentis, patris et filii, et spiritus sancti, descende sur te, mani et semper. Amen. Amen. And vos, and vos, te et vos. Vos, exactly. <laughs>